Coming up, Charles Bogle and Bill Zachman tell us the history of the Central Church of Christ since 1830 and what it means to our local community. That and much more on this edition of Community Insider. In what we call the 1928 building, uh, the 1928 building served this congregation for many, many years, but the church was growing. Uh, that old building would hold maximum 400 people. Uh, the decision was later made to build a 1,000 seat auditorium, and that's the building you see now facing south on Morford Street uh, from the uh, opposite side of Morford Street from the Warren County Courthouse. Well, I'd like to join you and uh, invite you to be with us for the next uh, almost a half an hour as we take a look at the history of Central Church of Christ. Uh, certainly one of the uh, most influential and impactful spiritual institutions in Warren County and the effect of Central Church of Christ radiated out far beyond Warren County uh, across the nation and in fact in many places around the world. Well, for this session, uh, I am pleased to have with me a good friend, Charles Bogle. Charles, uh, former Menville Postmaster, well-known, well-beloved, uh, one of the most effective uh, and gracious people I've ever had the privilege of knowing, uh, also serves as the historian for Central Church of Christ. Uh, Charles, it's so good to have you with us, uh, a former elder here at the church. Uh, you have made a study of the history of the, of the church. and. Community TVTN is brought to you by Security Federal Savings Bank. Proudly serving the community we call home. Grace Family Pharmacy announces new medication packaging service. It provides a simpler, safer medication experience through convenient, personalized packaging using the latest in pharmacy robotics. We're located at 357 West Main Street. Our phone number is 931-473-6418. Community Network Productions takes you inside each community with local interest stories, local music artists, and information. With each show, the focus is the people and our beautiful community. With our creative team, we customize unique show ideas with our friends in the community. Our focus is you. See each of our shows on all social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and at our website at www.communitytvtn.com. The My Usage app is a way to conveniently pay online, anytime, day or night. You can also come by any Caney Fork Electric office and sign up for the prepay option available using the My Usage app. Know exactly how much electricity is used each day and the cost. Best of all, no monthly bill. You can set up email or text alerts. Keep track of your usage and pay your bill, all with the My Usage app from Caney Fork. Caney Fork Electric, keeping you informed. Welcome to another edition of Community Insight. Join us as we travel Middle Tennessee, uncovering history and experiencing the adventure of unique stories and events coming to you inside your community. And 
And uh, we're doing a historical perspective. Uh, Jonathan Womack, the videographer, editor, producer. This is Bill Zachman. My guest for this segment is Charles Bogle, uh, who is, I guess, by definition or by default, the historian for Central Church of Christ. <laughs> I don't know about that. But, uh, but thank this, you for the compliment. Uh, well, uh, you keep up with the history, and somebody needs to do that. And I can't imagine anybody better than better than Charles to do it. Uh, but we're looking for a final product of 25 minutes uh, for uh, distribution through whatever channels and also for the Central Church of Christ archives. So if everybody is ready to go, let me get my timer. Where'd the timer go? Okay. This is Bill Zachman, uh, one of the lifelong members here at Central Church of Christ has been known as the downtown church with the open door. Well, I don't mind telling you I was born in 1948, and back then uh, at the old McMinnville Medical Clinic, uh, the mothers uh, and the babies stayed in the hospital for a few days. But uh, I don't remember this myself, but uh, what some of the uh, older members at Central told me later was that I was literally a babe in arms. My parents, uh, George and Marie Zachman, brought me in. And uh, we worshiped, uh, or I probably screamed and cried most of the time, uh, in the pews, those semicircular pews in what we call the 1928 building. Uh, the 1928 building served this congregation for many, many years, but the church was growing. Uh, that old building would hold maximum 400 people. Uh, the decision was later made to build a 1,000 seat auditorium, and that's the building you see now facing south on Morford Street uh, from the uh, opposite side of Morford Street from the Warren County Courthouse. Well, I'd like to join you and uh, invite you to be with us for the next uh, almost a half an hour as we take a look at the history of Central Church of Christ. Uh, certainly one of the uh, most influential and impactful spiritual institutions in Warren County and the effect of Central Church of Christ radiated out far beyond Warren County uh, across the nation and in fact in many places around the world. Well, for this session, uh, I am pleased to have with me a good friend, Charles Bogle. Charles, uh, former McMinnville Postmaster, well-known, well-beloved, uh, one of the most effective uh, and gracious people I've ever had the privilege of knowing, uh, also serves as the historian for Central Church of Christ. Uh, Charles, it's so good to have you with us, uh, a former elder here at the church. Uh, you have made a study of the history of the, of the church. And just to get things started, I'd like to go back to the very beginning. The year was 1830. Uh, this was the time when we, we go back to the first meeting of record of Central Church of Christ, what became Central Church of Christ. Uh, it was in the former Warren County Courthouse. Now, not the present courthouse, but that old courthouse sat in the middle of what is now the downtown McMinnville Park, the diamond-shaped park. Uh, Sandy E. Jones was the first preacher. Uh, do you remember anything about the literature from the time, the history of the time, of what he preached about? Sandy Jones. Well, I can just tell you that uh, it says he preached his uh, first sermon here. Uh, that was a great gospel sermon taken from Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. Okay. Uh, from that uh, humble beginning, from that modest beginning uh, in Borod facilities, the Warren County Courthouse, uh, the, the church grew numerically and spiritually. Uh, more and more people were interested. Uh, this is that part of American history uh, during this time is what uh, some of the historians call the Second Great Awakening. Uh, there was a, uh, just a groundswell of spiritual fervor uh, in the nation, uh, sort of a, a turning to the Bible, uh, and basically a, a reformation of a lot of uh, personal morality uh, and maybe public morality. Of course, that 
had its ups and downs along the way. But after that beginning, uh, the, the church continued to grow. But it was growing into the antebellum era, the era just before the outbreak of the Civil War. So what was Central Church of Christ? What came to be known as Central Church of Christ? Uh, what was going on at that time in the community uh, and in the church? Well, I'm not sure I could... could uh tell you that much about it. It just, it just says from the history here that during the Civil War at the uh, meeting house and, and basically if I understand it correctly it was more like a house mm -hmm. just for assembling together that it deteriorated extensively and so at the close of the conflict uh, such members as H.L. Walling, Jonathan Logue, J.T. Webb and others repaired the building and the regular Lord's Day worship then was renewed. So, you know, there was just a, they, they were just really searching to, to be able to come together mm -hmm. and uh, to really form the church uh, and, you know, bringing in new members. Well, the war destroyed so much, and what it right. didn't destroy, it, it definitely disrupted. We know from our experience uh, over the past um, two and a half plus years with the COVID-19 pandemic, how every facet of life, including church life here at Central, was disrupted and in a, in, a, in a big way sort of knocked sideways, and we're still in the recovery phase after that. Um, in, in the Church of Christ here, Central Church of Christ, would it be fair to say, would you, would you guess that there were, um, of course, Confederates, but also some Union sympathizers? How, and, and McMinnville, according to one local historian, changed hands 11 times during the course of the war between the North and South. Uh, it was a rail heading right. uh, at the time, which made it valuable. Uh, very, very valuable. Uh, so, how, how did how did Central Church of Christ come out on the other side after after Appomattox, uh, the end of the war in, in April 1865? Uh, how did the church come out? Apparently, there was some growth. So, whatever political feelings there were, they managed to heal the differences. Apparently, so. One of the things that uh, I think is really interesting is that David Lipscomb played a very prominent role in reinvigorating the brethren here and then for the church to begin to, to, to actually grow. In fact, it mentions that after Ben Franklin of Cincinnati, Ohio, held a two-week meeting in 1867, it helped, that, helped the church to really unify and grow, really beginning to grow, so to speak here. Yeah. Uh, maybe the war experience uh, with so many families losing a son, uh, a father, a brother uh, in the conflict, plus all the economic disruption. Uh, they're having their farms virtually wiped out, mm. uh, destroyed, their, their livelihoods destroyed. Maybe there was a searching for some higher value, some, some spiritual value that transcended the the material loss that they suffered right well i'm sure that i'm sure that that would be true and uh, maybe from time to time we have these traumatic experiences whether individually or or as a society and uh, and and we want to go back um, uh, according to uh, a, a white paper, this was uh, done uh, by Perry Cotham and uh, and some some others. We'll, we'll give credit for that uh, in our production. Perry C. Cotham, um, the uh, the church at that time had a membership right after the war of about thirty, but it grew to more than a hundred. Right. In fact, that's some pretty rapid growth. I think it mentions here that that actually uh, the uh, 175 seat red brick building was erected in January through October the 1st of 1878. Mm -hmm. and so that was that would meant that you know they were really making some progress. Yeah, when you outgrow at, your at your meeting that point, facilities, you're you're right. making progress. Uh, Cotham's paper points out that uh, some of the leaders in the project uh, to build that bigger building were Jesse Walling, W.P. Faulkner, O.M. Thurman, J.C. Martin, uh, W.E.B. Jones, um, and uh, 
resulted in a 175 seat uh, red brick building uh, starting uh, in October, the construction started in October of uh, 1878, but it faced west. Was it on this same lot or was it in a different location? Now that that I, I really couldn't answer for sure. Mm, okay. Uh, some of the successor buildings were on this right, lot, but there right. was one uh, whose facade is, is reminiscent of First Presbyterian Church here. It look, they look very much the same. Mm -hmm. So you might guess that the same architects were involved and they just rolled out mm -hmm. the, the same plans for different uh, uh, church customers. But uh, at that time, it was not known as the Church of Christ because the sign over the door said Church of God. Right. Uh, and this was some, that uh, 1878 building. At some point, I think it's even maybe a reference to Christian church. Okay. Also. Okay. So just like uh, living language changes over time, even even labels uh, can change over time uh, as as they did. Uh, Cotham's paper says that evangelist T.B. Larimore held a six-week meeting in 1896, immersed 115 precious souls into Christ. Uh, what would happen in 2022 if you held a gospel meeting for six weeks? You probably... Your attendance would probably be would be going down rather than increasing. <laughs> well, However, so. uh, there have been instances where a meeting would be scheduled for one week, and because it had gone real well, it would be extended maybe a day or two or or three. Mm -hmm. And then I think in Morrison, at one time, I to use that as as an example, it may have ended up being more than two weeks. Yeah. An extension. Yeah. Uh, there was this thing called the Brush Arbor uh, meetings, apparently under a tree. Is it, do I have that right? Well, I have actually seen one, and it was built out of trees, kind okay. of woven together. Okay. Or you had a you had a covering of trees that were placed. You know, they may have used some wire underneath it, you know. Okay. But but basically, that was the Brush Arbor. So it was sort of a temporary <laughs> building built with uh, materials close at hand. They didn't go to Lowe's to get their building That's exactly materials. Right. They just chopped it down in the woods. Uh, in the year 1902, we have a record that says membership reached 400 in 1902. That's pretty good. Okay. So 120 years ago, the membership was 400. Uh, the things uh, things changed uh, over time. Uh, the pulpit minister at that time in 1902 was J. Paul Sladen. Uh, the elders were W.S. Dad Lively. That was the famous photographer right. uh, and, and community leader, uh, Dr. A.J. Trail and Tom Mason. Uh, things things continued to grow, and then we had the 1928 building, and I made reference to that when we started the 1928 right. building, where I kind of grew up. And uh, but that uh, had had 400 seats. Uh, that wasn't going to be quite adequate, so it was in. Um, uh, 1972 up through October of 1973 that the present building was built uh, with a nameplate capacity of about a thousand. thousand right. you'd, you'd have to put them in here with a shoehorn if you got right. a thousand in here. It right. would be tight. I think we're on record of saying, it, and I believe I'm right, on 2003, our gospel, gospel meeting, that we had the largest attendance in the new auditorium of 930. Hmm, 930. 930. I can remember that, uh, but we had to have uh, folding chairs out in the aisles. Right. I'm sure the fire marshal would have a, have an issue with that. But well, probably the largest kind of, probably the largest uh, audience we've had in the building was for a funeral for a, a, hmm. a really popular young lady who. Graduated from Warren County High School, was attending Motlow and had an accident. And we put chairs out again. And, and by the way, the, the larger part of the audience was with young folks attending, and you still needed additional seating. Mm. So we, we, we estimated it probably reached the thousand. Oh, okay. 
even you know, though they weren't for a funeral for counted. Yeah, pop, popular, popular young lady right. who died tragically. I'm sure it is. Uh, we were talking before we, we started this uh, video recording. Uh, you have a copy of the church directory from 1952. I would have been four years old. Uh, when you dialed up the number for the office at Central Church of Christ, what number did you dial? 374-X. Now, I'm not sure if you actually dialed that or if you still had an operator. You told the operator. <laughs> Give me, what was it, 374? 374. 374. Uh, okay. The era of the three-digit phone numbers. That was 1952. Okay. Uh, does your directory tell us who the pulpit uh, preacher was and the elders at the time? Well, it does. Alan Fye was the minister mm -hmm. at that time. And... Uh, Yeah, I think it mentions the, the elders at that time were uh, R.G. Hutchins, O.L. Hammer, Grady Womack, F.C. Boyd Sr., and Tom Cale. Hmm. Uh, all now deceased. That's that's that would be correct. Yeah. Uh, throughout history, uh, there have been some of the major leaders. Uh, uh, in in the in the history of Central Church of Christ, and uh, a lot of that has been documented and, and preserved for history. Um, so they, these are the, these are the leaders, and this is the way uh, churches of Christ are, are governed uh, by uh, a board of of directors, basically known as elders, using the uh, New Testament uh, language. The, these are the elders. <clears throat> And they basically uh, basically make the uh, make the most important decisions uh, in the congregation, including uh, appointment of the uh, pulpit minister. Central, I think I said in the introduction, Central had a really an outsized impact in this community uh, and in many places uh, around the world through missionary efforts. But but right here in Warren County, I think Charles, you have actually identified uh, five congregations that were essentially spawned by Central Church of Christ. Five additional congregations, so that is a lot of influence. That's a lot of impact on the community. It, it, it really is. If What the history says is that that in the past, and, and we're using the time of this writing, that in the past 30 years that uh, Central has, has uh, given, and this is the term it's used, is given some of the charter members to five other congregations. And so it, it mentions West Riverside. And then, you know, if you think about it, for those folks who are having to cross the river, so to speak, to come to Central, it was, it, it was mm -hmm. sort of behooved them to meet on the other side of the river, so to speak, in a good location. And so uh, West Riverside was was uh, spawned. So was that. that was that the first one that's that was identified? First, that coming? was the first one. It was identified. Okay. Yeah. And and you bring up in that era, we were sort of in the transition on transportation from horses and mules to automobiles. Right. Uh, the roads, the public roads, were nothing like we have today. That's correct. And they were very much subject to impacts of weather. Uh, the rainy seasons, I guess, could have made travel difficult under the best right. of circumstances. Just so maybe that's one of the reasons why there are so many congregations, congregations scattered right. all over the, all over right. the county. Well, you had uh, it mentions that in Sparta, out on Sparta Street, at the east end area, they had a tent meeting, and from that tent meeting, then of course the East End Church of Christ uh, was formed, you might say. Uh, Mount Leo was sort of in that same mm -hmm. category. Right. And then in the Bobby's area, going out Smithville Highway, so to speak, uh, they were meeting in a, in a location there, but the Bobby's Branch Church it seems mm -hmm. formed. Yeah. Now, this is also a time uh, our viewers might kind of look back on the history when we were having a lot of residential development. Uh, McMinnville was really growing. Right. Uh, houses were being built. All these areas you talk about, there were there were there was new housing going up. Right. That's correct. And then, of course, the last congregation, of course, would be Westwood. 
and, and basically, uh, with a lot of the members, in fact, uh, uh, one of the elders, I think, left and went to be a part of the mm -hmm. Westwood Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Boyd well, family, right. the Boyd family right. played a very large, right. uh, a very large. But they had been meeting in a packing barn of the Boyd Nursery, mm -hmm. and then then erected their new auditorium. Yeah. Uh, in in 50, 1952. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a record of all of the uh, in front of me of all of the uh, overseas missions, domestic and overseas missions <clears throat> that uh, Central Church of Christ has contributed to. Uh, but the church uh, financially supports these and sometimes supports the, uh, the missionaries, the, the, the ministers, the right. preachers who go out. Uh, the church has also supported Christian education uh, for uh, young, young men in, in the church-related colleges and universities to help them. Uh, on their way toward a career as right. uh, Church of Christ preachers. Yeah, uh, sometimes they, to the universities or sometimes to preachers, preacher schools. Mm -hmm. And then uh, had two missions, one in Galax, Virginia in the 60s, mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. Right. And it, it became self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And then also in Hazard, Kentucky. Yes. In the 90s and it became self-sufficient. So, uh, so it's always been a good mission work. Yeah. Well, you know, over 2,000 years, this idea of going out, you know, that's what the Apostle Paul was doing. And he, he was the, to, to borrow a term from our friends in the, in the Roman Catholic community, he was the iconic apostle to, to, bring, uh, to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to sometimes some places that seemed very unlikely, very uh, inhospitable to the Christian that's, message. That's, that's, and uh, that's Paul would true. just wade right in. Uh, I, I, I take a back seat to no one in my admiration and amazement mm -hmm. at the Apostle Paul's, uh, I guess you might say, well, number one, his faith, his faith in, in Jesus Christ, but maybe his audacity he would uh, he would take on he would take on all doubters, <laughs> all skeptics, all comers, and uh, but he planted he planted the seeds. It's amazing what he endured. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, so we here in the year 2020 have it pretty good when we come into an air conditioned or in the winter nicely heated building, mm -hmm. sit on uh, padded uh, pews and. That's right. Uh, have nice electric lights, uh, sound amplification, and everything. As far as creature comforts, uh, but this is this is a far cry from what it was back in the year 1830 when Sandy E. Jones preached the first gospel, first gospel sermon. Yeah, don't really know the, the history behind how he even arrived here. Mm -hmm. But we're thankful that he did. Yeah. Well, from uh, little acorns, mighty oak trees grow, and I, I think that's certainly been been the been the fact with Central Church of Christ. Uh, so many things we could cover, but time is limited, uh, and I, I appreciate your sharing your thoughts and uh, your your information with us. Uh, so important to keep these things uh, in our memory, and if they're not recorded in print form or, or video or some electronic form uh, that can easily be lost. That's true. Well, it's, it's hard to believe that when we think about it, 1830, this is 192 years. So we're eight years away from a, a milestone mm -hmm. if the good Lord allows it to happen. Yeah. We have 200 years. 200 years coming up. Almost within sight. Almost. Almost. Well, it will be a, it will be a cause for rejoicing. Any institution that can stand for two hundred years has got something going for it. We've yeah. been very blessed. Yeah, come through the Civil War, through two World Wars, the Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, the Great Depression, and the COVID nineteen pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what what else what else is out there? Charles Bogle, I thank you so much. I, I consider a you a, a, a wonderful a friend. You and uh, your 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 wonderful wife, Rosine. Thank you for your service to well, not just this church, but to the community. She's she's been very instrumental in work here at Central. 
as a as a retired elder, you might give a shout out to elders' wives because they're back home doing a lot of the work, That's, where the well, elders are out taking care of church. I work. always gave her a lot of credit, and I still do. I'd come home sometimes, and she'd have all these notes. She was very good to oh yeah keep keep, keep me abreast of what was happening, she, she or what would, someone was asking about. Yeah. Or, yeah, she would Ooh, give you my telephone messages. I <laughs> see what Charles Bogle. Uh, I want to thank Charles and uh, thanks to our viewers um, for this uh, special video production. Uh, taking a look at this point in time, uh, back on the history of Central Church of Christ, dating its origins to 1830. This is Bill Zeckman for the Central Church of Christ.